From motor oil to glue, products we use daily are better because of rheology. Rheology keeps asphalt from melting on a hot day and peanut butter from getting stuck in factory pipes. We're learning about this go with the flow field of science next on this episode of Technology Today. We live with technology, science, engineering, and the results of innovative research every day. Now, let's understand it better. You're listening to the Technology Today podcast presented by Southwest Research Institute. Hello and welcome to Technology Today. I'm Lisa Pena. I recently heard a presentation about rheology by SWRI senior research engineer, Dr. Carlos Sanchez. What struck me is how important rheology testing is to so many industries, yet many of us are not familiar with this field. Simply put, rheology examines the behavior of fluids and materials at different pressures and temperatures, and the findings make products we use every day better, easier to use, and safer. Dr. Sanchez is here to help us understand the role of rheology in our daily lives. Thank you for joining us, Carlos. Thank you for having me. So to start, how do you explain rheology? We gave a brief definition there, but what is it? Uh, yeah, so the definition you gave was great. So rheology is um, the study of the flow of matter. So the flow behavior of materials, everything from, you know, think about water flowing out of a bottle to even plastics that melt and need to flow to form the shapes that they take uh, in the final product. Um, so yeah, we use it every day, whether we realize it or not, you know, when we're pouring uh, our coffee in the morning to when we're squeezing a tube of toothpaste to brush our teeth. And, you know, it relates to how products look, how they behave, and we're able to analyze and better understand them through rheology testing. So why do we need rheology? Why is it important to have this type of data available uh, when you're putting out products we use every day? Um, so rheology basically gives a number or a value that can be used to describe certain phenomena for a particular product. So think of how, you know, how, how honey is able to be poured out of a jar or a container or how, you know, something's be able, been able to squeeze out of a container, how a motor oil is able to flow through your engine. Like all those behaviors relate to how it's going to perform in that system or, you know, how it's going to look in appearance on a shelf or on your food, on your plate. And being able to characterize that is very important. So that way, you know, these products behave the way they need to and they remain consistent from batch to batch, process to process. So the appearance and stability of a product that, you know, if it sits on a store shelf, it needs to go from the store to your house and have the same type of consistency. It needs to have a certain shelf life. You know, it needs to last, you know, months on end. It's not going to collapse on itself. Uh, likewise, it needs to perform well in a real system, say an engine oil um, running through your engine. It's, it's able to lubricate the parts and flow properly. And likewise, last a very long time. You don't want to have to change your engine oil, you know, every week or so. It needs to last, you know, over several thousands, thousands of miles. And rheology helps us to better understand those materials to make sure that they're going to behave that the way they need to at certain temperatures, certain pressures, and certain uh, shear rates or, or forces being acted upon them. It ensures our condiments aren't clumpy and our motor oil flows smoothly. Um, what other roles uh, does this field play in our day-to-day -day lives? Uh, yeah, so rheology is used in a lot of industries. I mean, uh, it's a very universal science, but it's not very well known. But you can see it in action through things like confectionaries, like candy, um, understanding the flowability of beverages like sodas or, um, or even just water. Um, the cosmetics industry uses it quite frequently to measure the consistency of, you know, makeup and lotions and that sort of thing. Um, but beyond that, uh, being able to understand how a fluid is able to be pumped, you know, through, through a factory or how it's applied when you actually get it to your house, whether it's squeezed properly through a, a bottle or a tube uh, or even like at the factory through a nozzle. Um, so those fluids need to maintain a certain appearance, have a certain texture to them um, for them to actually be, be used properly, whether it's a lotion you're rubbing on your skin or if it's, you know, peanut butter you're spreading on your toast. I mean, all those factors can be better understood through rheology. So people who rely on rheology testing know all about this field. However, do you find that people in general don't know much about rheology? How do you educate people about this area of science? Yes, that's a good point. So, I mean, rheology is very universal. I mean, like I said, you see it everywhere, but uh, not many people, unless you actually have done testing before or work in the industry, know what it is. So even like some of the clients we work with at SWRI will come to us with a, a problem that they have. 
you know, whether it's the pumpability of a fluid, you know, they're usually concerned that, oh, maybe it's the viscosity is too low or it's too high. Uh, but they're not familiar with what rheology does. So with rheology, you can actually look at the internal behavior of a, of a fluid to better understand how, why it's not flowing properly. Um, so being able to educate people on that, they can better understand how their fluids are behaving. Um, beyond that, I mean, just trying to um, explain with real world examples how rheology can be used, um, you know, in your day-to-day -day lives, in your household, um, then people can kind of pick up what rheology is. So one of your star examples of rheology is silly putty. Um, why is that such a great example of rheology? Yeah, so I never introduce uh, rheology to people. I always use silly putty because it's such a uh, well-known toy. I'm sure you play with it at some point or some people have it in their houses now. And it has a really fun behavior to it. So if you pull it really slowly, it stretches real easily and you can get it really nice and stringy. But if you pull it too quickly, it breaks or it snaps apart. Or you can roll it into a ball and actually bounce it around like a rubber ball. So that material or a silly play is known as what's called a viscoelastic material. It means that it behaves like a viscous liquid in certain uh, situations or an elastic solid in other situations. Uh, so, but there's a transition point and that relates to how quickly you're actually deforming the material. So if you deform it too quickly, it acts like a rubber, like a solid. If you deform it very slowly, it flows like a liquid. And there are a lot of materials that behave like this, just to different degrees, not as severe as a silly putty. But it really illustrates well how, um, you know, by better understanding that real rheological behavior, you can see um, that across many other materials um, from your day-to-day -day experiences. So you mentioned a few of the industries that rely on rheology to make products look good and perform well. Um, can you just kind of give us a good thorough list of, of a few of the industries where rheology is front and center? Uh, sure. So um, here at SWRI, I'm in the tribology research and evaluation section, and we do a lot of testing in the automotive industry for fuels and lubricants. So being able to understand the rheology of engine oils is very important and also fuels like gasoline and diesel fuels. Um, so when you're filling up your car with an engine oil, usually it's a certain viscosity grade, right? It's either a 5W30, a 5W20 or so forth. So being able to understand that viscosity and that behavior of that fluid as it's running through your engine is very important in, re in rheology. Um, so like I mentioned before, you can test uh, fluids at different temperatures. So your engine runs either cold or hot, depending on the weather, and also different shear rates if you're running at different speeds in your engine. So it has the fluid needs to be able to flow properly to lubricate all your components and flush out any debris that's in there. And at the same time, it also needs to have a high lifespan. So you don't want to change your engine oil after a certain number of miles. You want it to last a pretty long time. So automotive uses it pretty heavily. <clears throat> Another fun one is the confectionaries um, industry. So candy makers, there's actually some international standards for measuring the rheological behavior of chocolates. So you think chocolate, it's a solid at room temperature, but often you have to melt it to get it to flow into different molds to make whatever candy bars that you're making, or if you want to you know, drizzle it on some cupcakes or, or cakes and so forth. Uh, that flow behavior needs to be consistent, you know, when they're making the chocolate at the factory and also consistent when you take it home and melt it in your kitchen. Uh, so having those behaviors um, consistent throughout is very important. Uh, another interesting thing about rheology, it also kind of relates to how things taste. You know, there's a relationship you can get based on its deformation behavior when you're doing a rheology test to how it's going to have what's called a mouthfeel uh, when you're actually eating it. Um, so chocolate is another is perfect example of that. So a certain has to have a certain slickness or certain viscosity, and that relates how well it's going to you know melt in your mouth and how it's going to distribute along across your tongue and how it's actually going to taste. You know, there's relationships you can kind of establish through that. Same thing with beverages. You know, the way soda is going to taste, um, or the way coffee tastes. There's a whole industry dedicated to coffee rheology and how that uh, you know how you can brew coffee at, at certain concentrations and how it's going to taste, how it's going to feel. Um, the cosmetics industry is another prime example. So the way lotions or makeups go and spread across your face. Uh, so obviously a, a makeup needs to be kind of a, it needs to maintain its consistency in its container because you don't want to throw it into your bag and have it spill all over the place. It needs to maintain its shape. But at the same time, when you scoop it out with a brush or with your fingers, it needs to shear re readily and be able to spread easily on your skin. So all those are rheological behaviors that can be better understood through certain types of tests that we can perform. You had me at chocolate. 
Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, just the wide range of uses is phenomenal. Just pretty much everything relies on on rheology, and I'm learning new terminology here also. So, the rheological behavior is a is a big deal for all of these products. Uh, what is rheology testing? It sounds like you're dealing with a lot of different temperatures, and I know we discussed different pressures. Mm-hmm. Can you break down the testing process for us? Uh, sure. So, I mean, rheology, like I said, it's the it's understanding the flow behavior of materials. So you can have different types of systems that can do that. And everything from just simply pouring a material across like a slope and just seeing how long it takes to go down that slope. It's a very uh, qualitative way of doing something, but you can use uh, use that as sort of a general way of measuring the viscosity of a fluid. Um, the instrument we use is what's called a rheometer. Um, so rheology and rheometer. Um, so that system consists of different uh, test geometries. So you can, um, you know, depending on the shape of your material or how thin or thick that material is, you would need to change the container that you use to test it in. Um, so if you have like a really flowy type material, like a water, like a really thin material, you would use, you basically place it inside of a cup and you would have like a spindle that drops inside the cup. That spindle will spin at a certain rate under a certain temperature and pressure, and you can measure its flow behavior that way. If you have something really thick, then you need to basically put it in between two plates and where the bottom plate is stationary and the top plate kind of oscillates or rotates with the material in between it, and you can control the manner in which it's deformed. And we have all kinds of uh, attachments for the rheometer. We can, um, you know, pressurize materials up to, you know, 6,000 PSI. We can heat them up to 450 degrees Celsius. We can even cool them down to negative, you know, 40 degrees uh, C using liquid nitrogen. It all depends on what the the material requires and it's, you know, everyday use. Uh, you know, you try to best replicate what it's actually going to be used for, whether it's, you know, in a factory or if it's, you know, home use or if it's in an engine, uh, wherever that happens to be. Um, so the instruments we use are highly adaptable and you just need to know, you know, how to implement them to get the, the, the numbers that you're looking for. So ultimately, um, when you're dealing with a product, let's say peanut butter, and the issue is it's getting stuck in the pipes or something similar to that. Um, So are you trying to decide like, well, in this part of the process, it should be at this temperature, but if you move down the chain, this temperature is more ideal, or as it, you know, turns in, as you add this ingredient, um, this temperature works better. Is that sort of like, when it comes to production and manufacturing, are you trying to help them solve uh, those kinds of issues? Yeah, so... So I'm working on a couple of those right now. Um, so the peanut butter one, yeah, they're having issues with it pumping through their factory. So imagine, you know, it's a pump and it's going through tubes and it's getting from one side of the factory to the other. Um, well, the pump needs to go at a certain speed or a certain rate. So that rate that it's pumping it, you can relate it to how it's shearing or how it's deforming the fluid, so the peanut butter. The other thing too, I mean, in most cases, fluids, when they're heated to a certain temperature, they get thinner. Um, so their viscosity gets decreased. So if it's something that's a lower viscosity, generally you can pump it easier through a, t- a tube um, versus, you know, if it's at a colder temperature, it's going to be thicker. It'll tend to, you know, solidify a little bit more. Uh, so it all depends on what they're able to change at their factory. I mean, if you have like a large factory with a certain pump that you can't really change the rate of, you don't want to change your pump. But if you can say add a heater on one end of the factory to reduce its viscosity, you can actually pump it easier through that one section without having to change much in your total process. Uh, another thing is the nozzle that it goes through. I mean, if you increase or decrease the diameter of the nozzle, it can actually um, allow it to pump easier at the end point uh, when it gets to its final destination, which for a you know, peanut butter, it pumps through the jar real easily. Okay, so you're helping them pinpoint these issues along the production route and thinking of ways to uh, Correct. Make, it, make it better. Okay. Correct. So, yeah. So getting back to the actual testing, what I would do um, in my, on the rheometer would be, um, you know, putting the peanut butter into it and rotating it at a rate that's similar to what the pump would be doing. And then just ramping up the temperature to see what optimal flow behavior would be achieved at a certain temperature. So that way they can kind of, you know, to fine tune their settings at the factory. So we offer a range of rheological services at SWRI. Can you walk us through those? Uh, yeah, so um, we're the only rheology lab at SWRI, and as such, we service a lot of industries. Um, so rheology has applications in many industries, like I mentioned before. So we do testing across oil and gas, automotive. We do greases. We do food and beverage, cosmetics, pharmaceuticals. Uh, we study paints, adhesives. 
peanut butter or confections, like I mentioned before. And we offer many tests for measuring just something simple as viscosity all the way to the elastic behavior of material or its flowability, its melting behavior, uh, even like its surface tension or its uh, interfacial uh, relationships to interacting with different materials. Um, there's a wide range of, of testing services that we can offer. And like I said, different temperature ranges, pressure ranges, um, even electroreology. That's a pretty fun field that we're getting in right now or how a fluid behaves under electric or magnetic fields. Uh, that's becoming of greater interest lately. Um, and just being able to understand how fluids just behave in general. I mean, we have uh, clients that want to understand how sticky their material is. If it's a grease, you know, how well it's going to stick to whatever it is they apply it to. So you can measure the stickiness or the tackiness of a material. Um, or a creep test, you know, how well it's going to withstand certain temperatures over a long period of time. Uh, we mentioned uh, asphalts before. So there's a whole area related just to asphalts and how they're going to perform well in extreme temperatures. Think of really cold temperatures versus really hot summers here in Texas. You know, those asphalts need to maintain their shape. You don't want to have a bunch of potholes in your road, so they need to be tested in a certain way and maintain certain behaviors. And we can do that here at, at SWRI. What would you say is the most intriguing part of this area of study? Uh, so the most intriguing parts, I mean, the ones I find to be most fun are when you're doing uh, like long time studies on materials. So so like I mentioned before, like the shelf life of a material, you know, if you, it's like a jar of peanut butter at the store, it needs to maintain its consistency over a long period of time or an asphalt on the road. It needs to maintain that consistency over a long period of time. You don't want to have to repave your roads every couple of years. Um, so in rheology, you can what I find is really fun is you can take advantage of materials, time and temperature dependence and instead of running a really long test, like obviously you want to run a test that's going to take several years, you know, testing an asphalt. I mean, that's just not feasible, but you can take advantage of its temperature relationship and see how it's going to behave under short time frames and kind of expand on that and create what's called like a master flow curve. And those are always really fun to do because you learn about a, a, a materials behavior over a wide range of temperatures and time constants or time frames. Um, so think of something like a glue. So if you ever glued something before, it's like a white school glue, and you apply it to a piece of paper and you let it sit there overnight to to cure, to dry. Well, if you want to have it to dry sooner, you could heat it up. You can put it under a hot lamp or you can put a fan on it and kind of accelerate its its curing behavior. So we do the same thing in rheology. So we can put that material in our rheometer, and instead of waiting a long time for it to cure, we can heat it up and, you know, increase the time it takes, or reduce the time it takes to cure. And we do that at different temperatures and at different rates, and we can basically stitch those behaviors together to understand how the material is going to actually last over a longer periods of time. Um, so to me, that's always really fun to do, and I've done a lot of those lately. Um, I had one client in particular that had a, a adhesive. It was a hot melt adhesive, something like a hot glue. Um, but they needed to actually have it last a very long time because it's in a certain environment where it's under a lot of stress and various temperatures and so forth. So creating one of those curves really helped them to understand, you know, how it's going to behave um, over those certain time frames without, without having to test it at those time frames. Um, so I always find those to be really fun and interesting. I definitely wanted to include a discussion about tribology because um, – Rheology is under the tribology umbrella, and tribology is something we also do at SWRI. Can you <laughs> explain that to us a little bit? Yeah, so I am in a very unique position in that both of the things I work on, most people don't know what they are. Um, so <laughs> tribology, um, so fun. <laughs> give, me, give me a quick rundown of tribology. So tribology is the study of friction, lubrication, and wear, basically how uh, materials interact with each other. So any material that rubs against itself or rotates against another material, um, that's where you can use tribology. And you use it every day. I mean, from walking down the street, I mean, the way your shoes interact with the road or to the hallway to just anything like, you know, friction wise, um, you can use, you use tribology to better understand it. So we do a lot of tests to understand its friction behavior, you know, how well a component wears or how well it shouldn't wear. We look at different coatings, different lubricants and how well it lubricates the system. Um, so the way rheology comes into play with tribology is um, that lubrication aspect for the most part. Um, so if you're using a lubricant like an engine oil or a grease, um, so you can test the friction behavior and the uh, wear behavior of it 
um, but you also understand the flow behavior. So greases in particular are pretty interesting because, you know, they have, you know, a pretty thick uh, consistency to them. Um, but mainly that thickness and the consistency is mainly meant to, um, you know, contain that oil that's inside that actually lubricates the parts. That thickness to it is it just meant to keep it in its location. And so if you apply a grease, say, inside of a bearing or inside of a gears, a gear set, you want that grease to stay there. You don't want it to flow out. So being able to understand its behavior through rheology is very beneficial. Um, so that's basically how I came into uh, under you know studying rheology is through tribology. So I got into tribology first, and rheology was just sort of a uh, supplemental to a lot of the work that I was doing before. And here in the tribology lab, we use rheology to supplement some of our tribology work. But now it's become sort of its own thing where you can just study fluids uh, independently and to better understand their behavior. And if needed, we can actually do some tribology tests to supplement that. Uh, so an example would be um, we did a, a project on bug sprays which is pretty fun. Um, so, you know, think of a bug spray, especially now with all the mosquitoes out in the summer. You spray it on your skin, but you don't want it to be very greasy or very oily, but at the same time, it needs to stay on your skin. Um, so understanding that flow behavior of it spraying out of the container and also sticking to your skin and then the, re and the tribology aspect of it being, you know, not very greasy when you rub your hands across it. Um, so combining those two um, is uh, something we can look at in tribology and rheology in our lab. Okay, so we've talked about how, you know, rheology just does not get a lot of attention, but how important it is. Are there any famous rheologists or who are your rheology heroes? So, I mean, in learning rheology, I've read a lot of papers um, through different authors and different books to, you know, learn the subject matter a little bit better. But I guess like the most famous rheologist is Eugene Bingham. He actually coined the phrase rheology back in the 1920s, so about 100 years ago. So relatively speaking, it's a fairly, fairly new science, even though it's fairly universal. I mean, people have been looking at the viscosity of fluids, you know, since, I guess, the dawn of existence. I mean, you can always just look at how things flow. Same thing with tribology. Um, but, uh, you know, he coined the phrase and he kind of developed a lot of the theories and practices that we currently use today. And... Um, I guess most famously, if you've heard the name Bingham before, it's because it's there's a type of fluid that's named after him, a Bingham plastic fluid. So these are fluids that behave like a um, like a plastic or an elastic at, at, at steady state or just sitting on a counter on, or at rest and then start to flow when you apply a stress to them. So an example of that is peanut butter or a mayonnaise. So think about peanut butter when you scoop it out with a, with a knife or a butter knife. It leaves a lot of ridges inside the peanut butter and then you close up the jar and then you get come back to it the next day or a few days later and you can still see those ridges there from the knife you know from last time you used it uh, so that's like a plastic behavior where it's more of like a solid material so it maintains its shape over a long period of time but of course you know when you apply a stress to it, it's able to shear um you know so bingham was the one that kind of uh, you know discovered those materials and they were named after him for for that reason um uh, beyond that, I mean, it's hard to name certain people, um, but I mean, there are certain authors I usually come across pretty frequently, and I kind of hope to be, you know, in that, you know, conversation, you know, eventually, you know, with the, with the research that I can continue to doing here at SWRI. There will be Bingham 100 years later, Dr. Sanchez, I'm sure of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hopefully, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, so any fun facts that you would like to share about your field? You've uh, given us a lot of fun information today. I mean, everything. From yeah, I mean, I always just like uh, like fun facts. I mean, just giving people examples just so they can better understand where it is. Because, I mean, since I've been doing rheology a lot lately, I always I always see it in my everyday, the everyday things that I do. So one of the things I, I do as a hobby is woodworking. And I like to put, you know, different finishes on my, my furniture or whatever it is that I'm making. And... You know, if you've ever done woodworking or if you paint something, you know that there's different types of paints that you can buy at the store. There's different qualities. You know, some cost more, some cost less. And I've I've used, you know, every range of that. I've gone cheaply and bought like the cheap stuff from, you know, a supermarket kind of place or I've gone, you know, higher end. And you can definitely tell the difference. And in doing rheology testing, I can understand why they cost so much because there's a lot of research that goes into their certain behaviors. Um, so if you're painting something, for example, it needs to have a behavior that's called thixotropy. And that's a big word, but basically what that means, it has a time dependent uh, flow behavior. So meaning when you take it out of the, of the paint can with your brush and you brush it onto your piece of wood, you'll, you'll see the brush strokes there at first. 
but after a while, the paint will settle and it'll reduce its viscosity and it'll give you a nice clean finish. Um, for cheaper paints, you typically don't see that. You'll see all these brush strokes all over the place and like it doesn't really look great. Um, so you kind of want to spend a little bit more when you buy, you know, higher end, like a house paint or whatever it is that you're painting. Same thing with a, a wood finish. If you're doing like a clear lacquer finish, um, if you're applying with a brush, you want those brush strokes to dissipate. You don't want them to be all messy on your on your nice, clean uh, table that you're making. Um, so, you know, just coming, you know, being able to understand rheology and you see those things in action every day. Thixo thixotropy. Is that yeah. how you say it? Yeah, okay. thixotropy. thixotropy. <laughs> yeah, it's a fun so word to you, say. <laughs> yeah. Have you become like the rheology guy for your family? Like you're just walking around doing day-to-day -day <laughs> stuff and you're like, that's rheology. This is rheology. Yeah, yeah I guess it's, it could be kind of annoying. I mean, because <laughs> I kind of point it out now. Yeah, I mean, it's, I would it's, too. It's, like, a, I, it's a little more obvious. And yeah, well, thixotropy too, like another example is ketchup. Um so ketchup, if you ever use like ketchup in a glass jar, I know that they don't come in glass jar or bottles anymore. They're using it in squeeze bottles. But if you ever had it in a glass bottle, usually you need to shake the ketchup first to get it to flow out of that glass bottle. Uh, so that's thixotropy. So at rest, the ketchup is really thick. But when you start to shake it, you're agitating it and you're causing it to flow easier. So it starts to flow out of the bottle. But then, of course, after a while, it'll settle again. And it'll recede back into the bottle. But you need to shake it. But the more importantly, hey, cool, when it actually... That's a great example. <laughs> yeah, and another thing, well, they're in squeeze bottles now for the most yeah, part. Yeah, but we all, we've all been there where we understand the ketchup getting stuck in the bottle, but agitating but, but, it. Yeah, but aside from that, um, yeah, but aside from that, when it's you're squeezing it from like a, a squeeze bottle you know, onto your French fries, uh, the way that it sits on your French fries is also really important, the appearance. So like if it's a really runny type of ketchup, it's just going to kind of spread all over your oh, fries yeah, and be really no. messy. But it needs to have a certain thickness, a certain viscosity to stay and look nice and presentable. So there's a lot of research and a lot of, there's a lot of time that those companies put into that rheology testing to make sure their ketchup, you know, goes from the factory, mixing properly in the factory, going into the bottle and squeezing properly out of the bottle to look nice and presentable on your French fries or your hamburger. And at the same time, of course, tasting really good. Yeah. So, okay. So yeah. So you know, once you learn what reality is, you kind of see it everywhere. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's everywhere. Yeah. I have a feeling I'm going to be, um, I'm going to join the rheology club and and try to point it out in my day to day life. So yeah. I mean, there's just so many examples. It's just overwhelming. Uh, you know how much it's used. So you think you know there'd be more talk about this area of science. So good to good to be learning about it today. So. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about products looking better and being easier to use, but there are there is a safety aspect to rheology as well. I imagine, you know, you are making products safer, you know, when the road's not melting while we're driving on it, that type of yeah. thing, we're not slipping everywhere. Yeah. Um, what, what is the safety aspect of, of your work? Yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. I mean, like you said, we don't want the, the products to fail in their intended use. Like you don't want your engine oil to, you know, destroy your engine and you have your car break down in the middle of the road, or you don't want your, your roads to fall apart. I've, you know, I've done rheology looking at concrete before and how concrete settles. Um, you know, like our, all our, our clients use their products for a certain application and they don't want them to fail. I mean, whether it's being used in an automobile or a spacecraft, whatever it happens to be, you don't want those products to fail. So you know, our testing is pretty critical to make sure that we're evaluating them properly and giving them the right numbers that they need. Um, another aspect um, kind of related to what's going on now is actually medicines. So injections. So you think about, you know, a vaccine that's in a syringe and how it, you know, squeezes out of that syringe and actually goes into your body. So the flowability of that medicine inside the syringe, it needs to go out nice and cleanly. You don't want it to come out, you know, really abruptly or like sporadically. It needs to go nice and cleanly. And likewise, the way that medicine is actually dispersed inside your body, it's like a time release kind of thing. So that's all rheology as well. And in fact, we do a lot of work also with the uh, the pharmaceuticals group at SWRI looking at uh, micro encapsulation of uh, different medicines. So think of, you know, pills and how the medicines are housed inside the pills. It's usually like a polymer or a melt, maybe like a wax type material. Uh, so you can actually see how those materials melt on the rheometer um, relative to, you know, it's like a body temperature and how well they're going to disperse throughout over time. Long term, what impact would you like to leave on this field? Um, so like tribology, you know, rheology is a very universal subject, but not many people know about it or aware of it or what it can do for them. 
um, versus a more well-known science, like an archaeologist. I mean, people know what an archaeologist is and what they do. People know what a chemist does and so forth. But nobody knows what a rheologist is or what a tribologist is. Um, so often, you know, people ask me what I do. I always have to explain exactly what that is. But once I explain it, they understand it because they use it every day. Like, oh, you study friction, you study wear, oh, you study how things flow. Okay, that makes sense. So one of the impacts I like to leave is mainly just educating people on it and create more awareness of, of rheology and tribology at the same time. Um, so I do a lot of, uh, you know, as often as I can, try to give presentations or, you know, give some courses and try to teach people exactly what it is. I also enjoy educating my clients, um, especially ones that come to us saying, oh, I heard what rheology is, but um, I don't know exactly what we can do, but I know it can be used to help our product. Well, I'd like to educate them on what exactly that is and what it can do for them, you know, create, you know, uh, test profiles that they can use and also explain what the data means, how to interpret it so that they can go and then go back and educate, you know, their coworkers and what it is and kind of spread the word around. And beyond that, um, you know, a lot of testing we do is used to kind of supplement uh, tribology in some way, or it's used to um, put numbers to certain characteristics that we normally see, like stickiness or tackiness or, you know, melting behavior of a, of a material. Um, so you know, eventually I like to be able to create sort of like industry standards for certain materials, because uh, I find there's a lot of industries that use sort of a... Um, like in-house methods of testing their, their fluids. Uh, you may have seen, um, and I've seen like TV shows or like uh, behind the scenes kind of, of shows where they show how things are made and they'll show like a factory that says, oh, you know, we've made this product for years and it's like a food product. And the way we test it is we drip it off of like some, like, I don't know, some shelf or something, or we'll mix it a certain way and kind of just pick it up with a spoon. If it has a certain texture to it, then we know it's good. Well, that's really just qualitative. It's just looking at it visually or it takes a lot of experience. You know, that same person's been testing testing this thing for years or they taste it and they know it's really good. Well, if we create, you know, a rheological test for that and put a number behind it, we can test it more objectively and put and more consistently. So that way we can get, um, you know, better performance, better behavior and more consistent um, products in the endpoint. So that's kind of what I'm working towards. And I kind of have our own sort of in-house standards for testing certain materials that clients come back to us for, um, whether it's like a certain temperature sweep that we run or a certain shear sweep um, for a certain material type. And they'll come back to us for those same tests and they'll eventually start building up their catalog of materials using that same test method and replacing those old methods, in-house methods that they have that with these actual, you know, numbers and charts that we present to them. Um, so I just kind of want to keep going with that, you know, educating people and kind of building up, um, you know, different test, test methodologies and hopefully come up with different standards that people can use and benefit from. Well, great mission you have to make rheology more mainstream. You gave us some great examples today to really understand what you do. And it's been wonderful to shine a light on rheology and the type of testing we do at SWRI. Your work is definitely improving our lives, giving us better products, and putting safer options out into the world. So thank you for teaching us about rheology today, and thanks for being here, Carlos. Thank you guys for having me. And that wraps up this episode of Technology Today. You can hear all of our episodes and see photos and complete transcripts at podcast.swri.org. Remember to share our podcast and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Want to see what else we're up to? Connect with Southwest Research Institute on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Check out the Technology Today magazine at technologytoday.swri.org. And now is a great time to become an SWRI problem solver. Visit our career page at swri.jobs. Ian McKinney and Brian Ortiz are the podcast audio engineers and editors. I am producer and host Lisa Pena. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.